I don't see everybody online, but I'd like to give a shout out to the folks online. But let's try that again, shall we? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, as Tim mentioned, I'm Greg Tuhill for those online. I, uh, uh, I hope that uh, you've got sufficient caffeine. I've got my cup here ready to go, and I see various caffeines uh, and other libations. I'm not going to check what's in your cup, but uh, ho hopefully it's directed towards uh, boosting your performance and hydrating you well. So we're here because uh, we're all interested in better securing national security and national prosperity. That's our role as cybersecurity professionals, is to provide the means for others to get their jobs done in a manner that is effective, efficient, and secure. Uh, for those of you whom I haven't met, you know my background is military. Uh, I spent uh, officially 30 years, one month, and three days uh, serving the country as a member of the armed forces. I only know that because they read that on your retirement order at your retirement ceremony. We don't normally track the amount of days and such. Um, but during that time, you know, as a, uh, a professional military officer, um, it, it became readily apparent to me, uh, advancing through the ranks, becoming a, uh, a base commander and a wing commander in the Air Force, that teams are critically important to getting the job done right and well. And having some experience working with industry, it, it doesn't matter what you're in, .gov, .mil, .edu, .com. It doesn't matter the domain. Teams are what are effective in making sure that we can, in fact, execute our missions in national security as well as national prosperity, our economy, the uh, societal fabric that we have, everything. So our previous security strategies for the internet and for the cyber domain, I contend are failing us. They were great at the time. Technology has continued to improve. Uh, the uh, use of digital technologies into national security and national prosperity has reached a, a, a critical mass point. And with that, we've seen the rise of a lot of different things, such as nation state actors uh, attacking and trying to seek a competitive advantage in the digital world. We've seen cyber criminal groups uh, basically rise up to the point where they are highly well-oiled uh, machines of cyber uh, theft and cyber daring do. They're a threat to society. They're a threat to prosperity. They're, in many cases, a threat to national security. So the changes are uh, upon us. And our strategy has been focused on defense in depth, that you know, having that hard outer shell, you know, firewalls, hey, firewalls are going to save the day and keep all the chaff out. That's not happening. We continue to poke holes in through things like the virtual private networks, which came out about the same time as Derek Jeter was a rookie for the Yankees. Uh, during my time as the uh, uh, in, in the Air Force, and then I amplified this during my time uh, at DHS, where I was running the operations for the organization now known as CISA. Um, you may have heard, and some people have heard this already, but for those who haven't, I came up with a construct called Two Hills Law, talking about recapitalization of assets. And assets I view as hardware, software, and wetware with the wetware being the human element and part of the system. And I contend that um, one human year equals 25 computer years. So when you're doing recapitalization planning, you have to have some sort of construct framework or theorem guiding your recapitalization. I successfully used this model in the Air Force 
when I was running the information technology portfolio for the Air Force in our corporate uh, structure, fighter pilots could get that if I got a four-year-old computer, it's the equivalent of a hundred-year-old uh, box. And uh, how did I come up with this construct? Well, you all may have heard of the, uh, the theorem that one human year equals seven dog years. Have you heard of that? Okay, for the folks on TV land, I'm getting a lot of head nods here in Jordan Auditorium. You probably have also heard of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, right? And um, the Health and Human Services folks have said that the average lifespan in the United States uh, was at one point up to about 78.9, but it has been inching back towards 75. So we'll, we'll take that down and we'll round it to 75 because the math becomes easier, uh, particularly for my friends who are fighter pilots and have a lot of other things on their minds, so they want it as simple as possible. Because when you're flying a plane, you have lots of things to be thinking about. Just watch the Maverick movie for the, the scene at the, uh, you know, the main battle scene and get a feel for the complexity of the task, but the need for simplicity. So Microsoft comes out with a groundbreaking product. Oracle does, you know, they name the manufacturer in the IT and cyber realm. Generally, there's a generational jump forward about every three years as you take a look at the data over the last 30 years. We'll have an incremental jump forward. That's generally reflected in you know, the next big version of Windows, the next you know, version of X, Y, or Z. So I contend that if using the, the adage that one human year equals seven dog years and applying it to the cyber domain, that I take that 75 years as the average lifespan for a human, I divide it by three, which is the average lifespan for a technology piece. That could be hardware, software. I come up with one human year equals 25 dog years, or 25 computer years, I'm sorry. So with that rate of change, with that type of recapitalization out there, Many organizations are not recapitalizing, though. Even though we have Two Hills Law, and you can Google it. I did not put it out on the net. Others have. If you take a look at it, though, our environment is rapidly changing, but it's not universally keeping up. As a former uh, uh, cyber operator from the United States, um, I'm, you know, I'm a recovering cyber operator. I, I'm, I'm doing all right, though. Um, I focus in my attention on the defense, but I'm also sensitive to the offense, and I hope you will be too. Because if you take a look at the offense, what do we cyber operators look for? We look for seams. We look for the obvious. We look for things that are not properly patched or configured. Seams are something that, from a military standpoint, we look for in the physical world as well. We are going to exploit seams because that's generally where it's at the weakest point. Bad welds, I'm, I'm going to go in and I'm going to take advantage of that. If I've got troops that are not in a fully integrated line, I'm going to take advantage of that as well. I'm going to concentrate mass and puncture through that seam. We've been doing that in the physical world since the Peloponnesian Wars and well before that with Sun Tzu and his uh, theorems. The same applies in cyber. We are not doing a good job with our previous strategies. Uh, they've, be they've become overcome by events, and it's time for a new strategy. And that's where zero trust comes in. Zero trust, you've heard it uh, through our discussions yesterday. I contend, and I did while I was the federal chief information security officer um, working in Washington. I contend that zero trust is a strategy, not a thing. It's not a collection of products. It's not just the principles. It is a strategic approach to how we better secure our digital ecosystem. 
And if we do it right, we will produce better uh, support to our national security mission. We will better support the economy of our country as well as the global economy. And we will be in a much better place such that we will spend less and we will get more. We will deliver results that, more, uh, that are more effective, efficient, and secure. So what is zero trust when you're talking to boards and C-suites? I contend that zero trust is a security strategy, but zero trust is the starting point on the road to digital trust. So if you think about it, what are we doing with zero trust? Are we trying to get to zero trust? I say no. We need to start with zero trust and then work to a level of acceptable trust based on our risk, uh, our risk appetite, our budget, and all those other considerations that every organization takes a look at in balancing their risk posture as part of their enterprise risk management program. So as, as we go forward with today's discussion, I'd like us to um, take a, you know, kind of take an internal pledge that we're going to be ambassadors for zero trust in every organization that we deal with. That we're going to help frame for folks that zero trust is the starting point on that road to digital trust. It is part of the enterprise risk management program as well. Because every organization, it doesn't matter if it's military, government, academic, or in, in the general economy, or even at home, every organization should be adopting the zero trust strategy. And further, in implementing that zero trust strategy, we're going to have to overcome a lot of inertia. Because the, the previous strategy which was focused on defense and depth, which hasn't gone away. We thought the more we add on the layers, the harder it is going to be for the adversaries. But what did we create with that environment? We created complexity. And we said, well, I'm going to make it so complex for the adversary, they're going to go away. They're going to go, you know, they're going to chase after the the, the worst folks. It's like that old adage about how fast do you need to run when a bear's chasing after you? Just faster than the guy behind you. We did that in the cyber world for years, and it's now caught up with us because there's too many bears out there. There's Cozy Bear, there's, uh, you know, the Panda. You know, there's all, all sorts of bears out there. If we're trying to outrun the person behind us, guess what? There's too many bears. So we need to change our, our view of complexity because I, can, uh, I submit to you that complexity is the bane of security. The, uh, uh, many of my colleagues here have heard me uh, quote Star Trek uh, as an authoritative source for cyber uh, education and training and great quotes. So if those of you who have uh, seen the Star Trek movie starring William Shatner, know that Wrath of Khan, which was the second Star Trek movie, I contend is the best cyber movie ever, even better than War Games, because we learned a couple of things. First of all, um, James T. Kirk was the first really public hacker that was acknowledged uh, in public, because he, he, of course, hacked into the Kobayashi Maru uh, cyber exercise, right, the, the leadership exercise. But also, um, we saw an act of hacking at minute 52 of that movie. For those who have seen the movie, um, I, I'm going to show you what it is. For those who haven't seen it, I want to give you a spoiler alert right now. Because in f minute 52, the, uh, the, the antagonist Khan has hijacked the USS Reliant and has um, uh, basically bushwhacked the Enterprise. He's grievously damaged the Enterprise. He's killed numerous members of the crew. He's in a position where he can uh, completely destroy the Starship Enterprise. He wants to seek revenge on Kirk 
for something that happened in an episode that was aired in 1966. This movie came out in 1982. So Ricardo Montalban has had lots of time to think about how he's going to uh, act in this, uh, this new movie. But Khan says, you know, I want the Genesis Project. What's he want? He wants the data for the research that was done by Kirk's son and his future, or pardon me, his uh, past girlfriend, who was the mother of his son. He, Khan wants data, and he's willing to kill for it. And he's demanding it from the Enterprise. Kirk, of course, says, oh, Khan, can't do this. You know, the bridge is smashed. The computer's inoperative. Khan says, Kirk, I give you one minute. How many of you have ever seen a computer boot up and get restored in one minute, even in this century, let alone in the 23rd century? Kirk, he says, OK, I know that you're not going to negotiate. We'll figure something out. He's got one minute. So what's he do? He turns to communications officer uh, Uhura, tells her, you know, cut the mic, turns to Spock, and he says, Spock, bring up the command codes for the Reliant. Command codes? Spock says, he, he's a very intelligent guy. He's got you know, superhuman intellect and body strength. He's genetically engineered. Khan's probably figured this out, and he's already changed the code. And Kirk says, that's all we got. Do it. Kirstie Alley is the navigator. This was before Cheers and slim fast commercials and all the things that she's done in her successful career. She's the navigator. She says, I don't understand. And what happens to Kirk? What does he do? Well, first of all, he was 52 years old. One of the themes was this, him changing in age and experience. He pulls out his readers, his glasses, so he can actually see up close. He, he basically curses the fact that he needs readers. Spock's looking up the command codes. Kirk is playing with the, the, the prop, you know, like he's configuring something. And she says, I don't understand. And he said, Lieutenant, it's important to know how things work on a starship. We've created complexity so that we don't even know what's in our enterprise often, let alone how it's configured. Kirk knew the enterprise inside and out. He knew how things worked, and he used it to his advantage for the defense. He, as a defender, had the upper hand over the offense because his knowledge, his experience, overcame the disadvantage he was in. So what happens? Spock comes down, says the command code is 16309 for the Reliant. He says, OK, get ready. Khan comes up, he says, your minute is up, Kark. Transmit the Genesis data or die. Kirk says, OK, prepare for transmission. And he gives the wink and the nod to Spock. 16309 is plugged in. And Spock, uh, Kirk says, here it comes. And what happens? The command is given. The Reliant is now under the control of Kirk because Khan didn't change the default password. <laughs> Shields get dropped on the Reliant. Scotty, the engineer, he could give, what, two shots of the phasers on the Enterprise. The two shots were strategically placed because they knew where to place them. The Reliant is crippled. The Enterprise limps away to fight another day. A couple of themes there. First of all, it is a great movie. And you don't even have to be a Star Trek fan. It's, it's written like a Shakespearean you know, drama. But the, uh, when it comes to zero trust, a couple of things. You know, we're on the path to digital trust, but you don't start by explicitly trusting anybody or anything. You have to do your due care and due diligence until you get to an acceptable point of risk acceptance. That's what we're trying to do with Zero Trust. But we also have to do some other things. 
we got to address the issue of complexity. Because uh, as we learned in Star Trek III from Scotty, the more we overthink the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain. I translate that to um, the more complex we make it, the easier it is to break it. That's manifested through a lot of different things that we continually see in incident response. And uh, here at, um, at SEI and the CERT, which we've evolved to beyond just incident response, to we're, we're, think of us now as a cybersecurity engineering and resilience team. Yeah, we've already spawned an industry of incident response. And can we help with incident response? Sure, we have that capability. But we're trying to think the big thoughts that would take us future so we can do an even better job as a community. But as you take a look at the complexity that's out there and all the different incident responses, complexity continues to be a problem. We've got a training pipeline where we've got uh, huge workforce gaps, right? Why do we have workforce gaps? I contend complexity is part of it because the more complex you make it, the easier it is to break it. You're going to need more human beings out there in order to operate all these different things that we've got. If we keep on layering tool upon tool upon tool, and they're really complex, and they have a huge training pipeline, you know, we have some defensive systems that takes 18 months for technicians to get certified on. That's ridiculous. It's not sustainable. We've got to tackle that as a community. Some of you uh, heard some of the presentations yesterday talking about how complexity is an issue. I will, I am foot stomping that for you right now. We got to work together to make things simpler for the operator and put the burden of that complexity into our code, into the software that we engineer. And let's put the yoke of and the burden of complexity on the attacker. We talk about some principles of zero trust. You know, we want to implement least privilege. We want to do micro segmentation. We want to make sure that we assume breach and then we work our way in uh, from there. Ultimately, Greg should only see what Greg is authorized to see and nothing else. That's really, at the executive level, that's the concept I want boards and C-suites to have. And we want to make sure that we have the right tool sets in place to do that. But we want them streamlined. We want them simple to train to and simple to operate, but exquisitely complex for their adversaries. That's what we're trying to do. And then further, as we take a look from a zero trust standpoint, we, we need to uh, be focused on the effect of the organization. Remember I said effective, efficient, and secure? I don't want to go just pay for another tool. I've been a CIO of a very large government organization. I was on the federal CIO council. I was the federal government CISO. We're spending way too much money and not getting enough return. We've got cyber workforce gaps because we, we demand more people to run these grandiose systems that we can't sustain. We need things that are more effective, that work better, that are more efficient, cost us less in all resources, money, hardware, software, et cetera, but they produce better security. Greg should only see what Greg is authorized to see and nothing else. We need to change the conversation on zero trust. I need your help. We, uh, you know, join the cause, be ambassadors of this. Help me with uh, advertise the message that zero trust is the starting point to digital trust. It's a strategy. It's not a thing. It is something that we collectively do to better protect national security and national prosperity. And with that, I am going to pause and see if anybody has any questions, comments, queries, or letters to the editor. And we'll start inside the room here, but also uh, online, Tim, if anybody has any questions online. Okay, well, I will swill my 
my award-winning coffee that came out of a box uh, and, uh, and see if anybody has any, any observations you want to share about what I said. Do you think the Kobayashi Maru was a cheat, or was it just using the system the way that uh, the game should have been you know, built around it? That way? Um, I, I think that's a really good question, uh, Chase. And for those folks who are, uh, uh, who are online, uh, Dr. Cunningham asked if Kobayashi Maru was a cheat, or was that all just part of how it was designed? I think um, it's a combination of both. I think that it had poor security protocols that enabled a cadet at Starfleet Academy to uh, leverage that code to alter it and then uh, produce results that were unsatisfactory for the organizational goals and uh, missions. At its heart, I think it was poor uh, code and security uh, practices that yielded uh, the actual puncture and uh, the mutation of the, uh, the, the, the exercise so, uh, so that Kirk could get a passing grade. Um, and further, I think I place the blame not on the cadet, but on Starfleet Academy for not using zero trust principles and not necessarily having the best practices in software engineering, such as DevSecOps, um, which was created here at Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. I contend that if Starfleet Academy was truly following DevSecOps, uh, that the risk of uh, that incident occurring would have uh, approached zero. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, you'll never get to zero. And those who insist on always getting to zero always lose. And they spend too much money and they end up disappointed. Yeah, hey, Greg, just, just to yeah. put a final point on that, um, it was a zero day. And it had to be a zero day because it had the benefit of having never been tried. That is um, a matter of contention, Dr. Longstaff. <laughs> I see where you're coming from and I respect that opinion. I have insufficient data in order to substantiate that. That wasn't a direct quote. <laughs> I, it had never been tried. That does not necessarily mean that in, it, in, it, uh, in and of itself that he used a zero day uh, uh, piece of technology. He, he just may have done a, a zero day attack vector that could have been a physical attack vector as well. He could have been tailgating and got into some place. We don't know enough, um, and it will require some more, uh, more investigation and research. And uh, Strange New Worlds uh, Season 2 will be coming out in January, which will help along, along those lines, as will Picard uh, Season 3, hopefully. Mark. Yes, what is your um, position and thoughts and ideas relative to M2131? You just made um, incredible statements about complexity and simplicity, but yet when we look at M2131, in my opinion, it looks like it was written by a sim, and sims have been around for decades, and we're still in the same problem that we're in, but yet it's being used and leveraged as a component, critical component, what I would see, because it's published right out of the White House, and I kind of feel like you know, blind leading the blind a little bit on this. If it's been so effective or ineffective, why are we actually you know, using old car parts to build a new car? Uh, thank you for that question. I'm not wholly satisfied uh, with those memorandum that is coming out of there. There's some good parts of the memoranda that have been coming out of the uh, executive office. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, just as a... Uh, a Jeopardy trivia fact, all those come out of the Eisenhower Executive Office building, where I used to work, um, doesn't come out of the West Wing. Um, but that said, um, we've actually, in the in the CERT uh, division here at SCI, we've developed a, a, a conversation with the folks in the federal CISO's office. And Krista Russia, who is the the current federal CISO used to be on my staff when I was uh, the, the federal CISO, and he was he worked with me at DHS as well. Um, they're doing the best they can with what they have available to them. Um, 
there are some areas in there that I wholly applaud, and there's some areas in some of those memorandum that um, we have provided feedback to them that we said, yeah, we don't think that this is optimized right now. So uh, we're in conversation with them to try to refine that and to better inform their thinking. And we're also talking with uh, um, Chris Inglis and his staff at the National Cyber Directors level and um, helping them inform the new national cyber strategy that uh, that effort's underway. So when I'm in DC next week, I'll be meeting with, uh, uh, with some of Chris's team. But that said, you know, uh, we understand that there's some risks that are out there and we understand that, you know, many of us have served in government and in multiple roles. So we wanna make sure that we help our partners that uh, are in the dot mill and within the dot gov space understand their options. And I don't see any of the things that we are doing or recommending here out of SEI as being anything but additive. Um, and, and as you take a look at the intent of what's being um, put out with these OMB memos is um, there's flexibility in in the uh, governance and oversight mechanisms of the federal government so that if there's a better way of doing something and you can prove that with evidence-based research or other evidence, uh, empirical evidence, there is now uh, procedures in place through the federal CIO council and the federal CISO council to say, okay, here's the intent of the memo we're going to take this course of action. We're going to maybe insert this technology that permits us to retire this whole big stack over here. And it may appear to be contrary to any prescriptive type of descriptions. But if you take a look at it from a capability standpoint, there's a, there's a, a cultural shift that's underway where if I can do an introduction to some new capability or technical solution, just because it says like a sim or you know whatever, um, you get you can move forward fast on that. I don't I don't see it as a it has to be this you know, and, and a great point uh, on, on that that I see continue to see is discussions on VPNs. You know, for crying out loud, it, VPNs if they, they they first hit the market, albeit you know prototypes of 1996. Okay, uh, um, you never act with children or do math in public, but in here we are in 2022, 26 years after the first appearance of VPNs, you know, in, in, in a consumable uh, measure, you know, outside of the labs, 26 years. If I apply two Hills law, do the math. 26 times 25 is how many years old? It's over 600 years old. Now, when I was in the Air Force uh, on active duty and I applied to two Hill's law to cyber, I'd go in and I'd say, do you really want to, you know, fight a MiG-27 uh, you know, MiG or 29 with a right flyer? Well, what was going on 600 years ago in aviation? You know, spears. So are we going to fly, you know, try fighting a, a MiG-29 with spears? in the cyber domain, you know, that kind of a quote? No, I don't think so. I think there's um, rational people make rational decisions, but they have to be well informed. And for those of you in the vendor community, you gotta make your case. And we want, uh, we wanna make sure that for us and our role here at the Software Engineering Institute, we are identifying those best practices. We are identifying the best options. We are helping uh, to make sure that we are setting conditions where everybody can, can succeed in implementing this really important shift in strategy and strategic approach. And that's the mental uh, model that we're bringing to our research and the products that we're uh, looking to continue to share. Um, but I really appreciate that uh, question. And it's something that's really important for all of us to remember 
is Moses came down the mountain with 10 rules. Those aren't negotiable. Memorandum from OMB certainly are. So thank you for that question. Do we have any questions from online? Um, we were going to, because Jason, Jason's next on. So we were I know Jason really well. Oh, he can wait another minute or two. Um, this is from Vince. Um, and it's more so he just wanted to make this comment. Kind of thinking in terms of supporting the deaf industrial base, um, especially small and medium sized businesses, but also USG departments and agencies, I'd like to see cloud service providers and managed service providers in the forefront of implementing ZT for their customers. That's likely going to be a real multiplier for overall improved cybersecurity. That's really interesting, Vince. Thank you for that question. I, I'd like to see um, I'd like to see every organization manage their own organization using zero trust principles. And, and then further, I'd like some transparency so that if I'm a federal agency, uh, for example, or a military organization that's you know, doing some uh, uh, cloud you know, hosting or computing, you know, stuff in the cloud, and I'm a consumer of that cloud, I, I, there's some things that I would like as part of my zero trust strategy implementation, such as I, I want more than just attestation. You know, folks say, ah, oh, yeah, well, I run my company with zero trust principles. Really? Are you willing to submit to an independent third party audit? Hmm. Are you willing to submit to hunting or pen testing? You know, uh, you know, independent third party hunt and pen test capabilities. Um, I, I think cloud providers, there's some great opportunity uh, for cloud providers to demonstrate that they are they themselves are using zero trust principles and getting the benefits of the zero trust strategy, not only for the managing their own infrastructure, but helping to protect their customer base. And then further, when it comes to cloud, we've got the shared security model, which is problematic. I think there's an opportunity space for cloud providers to kind of change that paradigm and maybe be a little bit more assistive, particularly for small and medium businesses with, uh, with regard to security and uh, relooking how we do that shared security model. So uh, I, there's, there's a lot of opportunity space out there, but still, uh, if I'm putting my data in somebody else's computer, which is really what cloud computing is, you know, if I'm putting my data in somebody else's uh, computing infrastructure, I am having to trust them. Um, so if I'm starting with zero trust, um, I'm going to have to make some decisions based upon what their offering is, and if. I'm a federal department or agency or in the military, I think I'm gonna change my requirements to be um, uh, including zero trust and measures to prove that uh, those companies are providing the type of security that I would want to have implemented if I was doing it myself. Right. So, those are my thoughts on that. Okay, any others that have popped up? Okay, thanks so much, folks, for um, entertaining my thoughts and uh, giving me all those nonverbals that you uh, <laughs> here in the audience gave me back. And I'm prepared uh, during breaks to talk Star Trek, security, and the future. And, 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 and dogs' lives. And, and dogs' lives, too. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, and I look forward to the uh, presentations today. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, too, for your leadership in putting this all together today. Thank you. Thanks.